Hello everyone, welcome back to another video lecture for uh, Critical Reasoning. This is for the Formal Evaluations of Arguments module and this is video number two. I'm doing something a little different. I'm in a classroom here at Bellevue College. I thought, you know, instead of working around with Microsoft Paint and stuff like that, it'd be so much easier to just do some drawing. So I got a whiteboard here. Hopefully you can see this and, and hear me through my microphone and this will all work out great. Uh, I think this might be uh, a little easier and more efficient for us to get through some of the material. The main agenda, um, in the last video, we talked, or this is, I'm sorry, this is video three. This is video three, not, not part two. Video three. My apologies. Um, the last time we had a video, we were talking through how to understand truth tables and how to do truth table calculations, and we only had talked about the first um, three logical operators. So we had conjunction, and, we had disjunction, or, and we had negation that we talked about. And if and remember I, I mentioned these, um, at this point we've got really just basic three components to our logical symbol language. We've got the operators, which make complex claims out of simple claims. We've got letters like A, B, C, where you use P's and Q's. I don't know why we always use P's and Q's in philosophy, but a lot of P's and Q's. Um, and these letters stand for simple propositions that don't have any more complex logical structure inside of them. These are the, these are the simples. Um, but then we combine, like I could say P and Q, in order to make a more complex expression. And then we started introducing last time uh, how there can be also parentheticals. And we use brackets sometimes too. So we can do parentheticals. You know, I can now negate the claim that both P and Q are true, so I'm saying it's false that P and Q are both true. That's a claim I can make too. Um, I can combine these with other statements like R or not S. You know, we can we can make some pretty complex uh, claims by just using these three basic components: the simple propositional letters, the logical operators that combine them, and then the parentheticals that we use to keep track of all the structure. And I want to repeat a very important point that I talked about in the last lecture, but I just want to kind of do a little review here. To remember that these operators are functional. So that means that they always, uh, they have a little structure to them. They always put one thing with something else. I was talking a lot about chunking last time. To be able to see how like in this or, this is one big, this whole thing is one big or statement that just has this chunk together with that chunk. Okay. So ands and ors always work that way. They're always putting two things together. You can never have more. So doing like P and Q and R, this makes no sense. Um, well, I mean, I could make some sense of it pretty easily by just throwing some parentheticals in there. And really, this one, this won't matter whether I do uh, P, P and Q and R or P and Q. Oops, oops sorry. I'm getting an eraser. Here we go. I'm just erasing. Um, it won't matter whether I put the parenthetical like this or I put it like this, but that's just because of how AND works. If I made truth tables for both of these expressions and did that whole calculating thing that I did, that I demonstrated in the last video, we'd see that these two things have the same truth tables, which means they have the same truth conditions, and if logical meaning is just a matter of the truth conditions of an expression, then they mean the same thing if they have the same truth conditions. But things are going to get a little weirder if, uh, let's say, instead of two ands, we had an or like this. Now these two things do not have the same truth table. They don't have the same truth conditions. Um, and we could we could do that. Um, I actually want to do some more practice problems with you um, in this lecture. We'll probably get to that. Um, but I, uh, we can just sort of intuitively see the difference. This first statement here, this one is a big and statement. It's saying R is true and either P or Q is true. Okay, so definitely R, but at least one of these, maybe both, but at least one. This one is saying at least one of these two things is true. Either P is true or Q and R are both true. Um, so these are very different, right? This one is, I mean, on one, even, even our analysis didn't get any deeper here. Um, this claim, the first claim, is definitely saying that R is true, but the second one is not committed to that. This statement could be true if this, if P was true, and this was false, and that can be false by having R false or Q true, it wouldn't really matter. But R could be false here, and this statement could still be true. 
If R is false here, well, because it's an AND statement, both things have to be true, and that would instantly make the whole thing false. So it really can matter where the parentheticals are for how we're putting these chunks together. Okay, so that's, that's an important thing to remember. Um, and the other thing, before we go any further here, remember, negation doesn't glue together two things. It just negates one thing. So it has this kind of structure. Now, the two operators we haven't talked about yet that are the main thing that we need to talk about today are the conditional, this horseshoe thing, and the triple bar, or the biconditional. And both of these have the same structure of and, and an or. You know, they put two chunks together. But they're going to have their own um, truth functional shape. Okay, So the way that um, an and statement is true or false depending on its component parts is different than with or. We've already seen that. And it's also going to have different patterns here with the conditional if something, then something else and the biconditional, something if and only if something else. So that's what we're going to talk about right now. So let's, uh, after a little bit of review, let's do just a little more review. Um, let's, get, let's get our full truth tables up. The, the master truth table list is like your key for unlocking all the rest of these logical calculations. You want to know this thing like the back of your hand. I always uh, tell my logic students when I teach a formal logic class, I'm like, you don't want to just be able to look things up in the chart. You want to have it in your bones. You want to like have it so second nature that you don't even have to think about it. And the way you achieve that is by just doing a lot of practice. And I've already said, like, with logic, if with no other unit in this class, um, you want to do a little bit of practice every day. That's definitely the best policy here. So um, do practice it over and over. You do it the long way. Use my long method that I showed. Um, in the last video, we'll do some more of that to, uh, in this video. Um, but do it over and over, and eventually it'll become second nature to you. But you don't want to have to be looking things up on the chart every time. But that's where we start. You know, we'll start with the chart, and then use it over and over, and eventually you'll kind of get into the hang of it. And in fact, I will have another video where I'll talk about some tips and tricks, some little shortcuts that you can use. Again, like I said, like logicians like to be lazy. We want to be as lazy as possible. Uh, that's being a good logician is being a lazy logician. But you don't want to sacrifice accuracy and clarity with our analysis uh, for the sake of laziness. So we'd have to be careful. So we're going to do it the long way, and then we'll learn some shortcuts. But uh, here we go. Um, so we've got, we're setting up our conditions. And these could be anything. They don't have to be P and Q. They could be whatever. But these are just, you know, we've got, we have two different simple propositions. Either one of them can be true or false. You know, we've got two levers that can be in all these different positions, and we just need to cover all the bases. So they can be both true, one true, one false, one false, the other true, and both false. Those are the options. And then we want to see how do the different logical operators affect, um, uh, how is the truth of these more complex statements a function of the truth of its component parts? We've got and, and and works like this. Only true, and statements are only true if both of their component parts are true. Anything else, if there's at least a false one, then, it, then it's going to be false. And or is very different. Again, this is the inclusive disjunction. Inclusive disjunction. We talked about the exclusive disjunction last time. This is conjunction. And or. Okay. And this one we've got. Um, true, 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 false. Or statements are only false when both of their component parts are false. Otherwise, the statement is true. Because all it's saying is at least one of these things is true. And in each of these cases, at least one of them is true. No problem. So there we go. And then we also had negation. And negation, but not. It's just like, you can remember, the truth table for negations is just like a light switch. Every negation is like flipping a value from true to false or from false to true. So if P, if the thing being negated here is P, if the P part is true, then not P is false. But if P is in fact false, then not P is a true statement. And there we go. All right, so we got the next thing to talk about here, the conditional. And this is like uh, if-then statements. But there's actually a, a large variety of 
uh, conditionals, uh, words and phrases in English that will give a conditional logical relationship. Um, and we'll cover those in a later video when we start doing the translations from English into logic. But like I said in the last video, I think it's easier to learn logic by learning how the symbols work first, and then you know what you're really saying with the symbol, and you can see whether the English meaning should be captured this way or that way or whatever way in logic. So we're going to focus on what the conditional means in logic first, and then we'll figure out how it connects with English. Um, and the other thing, I have a, a, another disclaimer that's important to note here. So um, conditionals are actually pretty tricky business uh, in logic. Um, there are a great variety of them. I was, uh, just last year, I was reading a whole book just called Conditionals, and it was just about all the philosophical debates and disputes that happen in logic about how, what's the best way to capture the meaning of conditional statements. And what there seems to be a lot of agreement on is that they're not all the same. And there's, there's a fringe view that sees them all this way, but uh, not very plausible in my mind. There's a lot of different types of things we might mean when we use conditional language, and they're not all gonna be evaluated the same way in terms of uh, how their truth functional. Um, but that's an issue for like linguistics and logic to sort out all those different things. Um, in a kind of introduction to logic, we kind of pretend like all of those uh, complexities don't apply. And uh, that's just an illusion. I mean, this is, um, this is just for teaching pedagogical purposes. If you go on and take more logic, you'll learn about some of the more um, exotic varieties of conditionals that are out there and how to tackle them. But the one that we're going to be talking about is what's referred to as the material conditional. Um, and I will be explaining the meaning of this um, at, at some length. I, the, the conditional is not as intuitive as uh, some of these other operators. And so I'm going to try to explain that as best I can. But know that there's going to be some uh, ways in which your intuition might not fit with what we're talking about here because there are a great variety of conditionals out there um, that operate in a slightly different way. But we'll be, we'll be working with some, some, I think, more straightforward examples. You can see how it works the way that it does. But part of explaining the truth table is what we're going to get in this lecture. In fact, I'm going to tell you a little logical fairy tale about how the conditional got its truth table. And I'm going to give you uh, a little proof that will actually kind of um, show you, it'll give you a little window into how logicians uh, work, how they do research in the field of logic, how we can make arguments for why we're setting up our logical symbol language the way that we are with the rules that we have. Um, there's a rationale behind it. It's not arbitrary. And I'll, I'll be explaining that a little bit here. Um, but let's take, a, I don't know, let's make a some toy uh, conditional case. Uh, I actually, I really like the, I've used these before. They're grim, but I like them because they're just so, uh, their meaning is really in your face. So let's take, um, let's take this claim. If you cut off my head, then I will die. So here's a, here's a conditional in English. And again, I'm not really one to get into the English too in depth right now. But uh, you know, let's make our universe of discourse. Um, let's call uh, you cutting off my head. That's a simple proposition. It's a state of affairs that we can imagine. Um, let's call that B for beheading. And I, uh, if I die, uh, that, let's call that state of affairs D. So again, we're creating a universe of discourse here so we know what these letters stand for. Um, Oh, man, I used P and Q already. Well, see, the letters don't matter. They really don't matter. So as long as we're consistent here, uh, it won't matter if they are intuitive or not. So, let, okay, so we've already got P's and Q's here. So if you cut off my head, we'll call that P. And I die, that's uh, proposition Q. So this is uh, these are two different states of affairs. And a conditional statement is a complex statement that's talking about these, but putting them in this kind of hypothetical relationship. If one of these things happens, then another one happens. And the, that's the first key thing to kind of note about um, these sorts of uh, statements, is that they are not saying that these two things are true. We've talked about conditionals when we were talking about what makes for an argument before, and that was a key point to make about them, that um, a conditional is not saying this is true, and therefore this is true. That would be an argument. A conditional is just saying, if that's true, then this other thing will be true. But it's making no commitment to the actual truth or falsity of these individual statements, just how their truth is connected in a certain way. 
So when we start filling out the truth table here, I think there are, there are some values that are intuitive here. I think the first two values are intuitive. Um, let's say, uh, so someone makes this claim. Let's say uh, if you cut off instead of my, it would be weird for me to say this. Um, let's, instead of, let's talk about Tim. So if you cut off Tim's head, then Tim will die. And so this is a claim that one of your uh, you know, fellow classmates or something says, and you're like, hmm, okay, is that true or false? Or like, what would make it true? Or what would it mean for it to be true? What are the conditions under which it would be true? Let's figure that out. So let's say um, some, I don't know, this is where the imagination gets really grisly, but let's say uh, my head is cut off. The P part is true. And I die. Then uh, would you think that this statement that if you cut my head off, then I will die. Will that be true or false under those conditions? I think intuitively, I wish I, I can't talk to the students right now. I'm just talking to myself. But I'm guessing, I'm hoping that you would say true. Yeah, that's what would happen. That if Tim's head was actually cut off and he died, then under those circumstances, saying this statement would be a true statement. That at least this statement is consistent with this possible state of affairs. Okay, now here's where things get more interesting. Let's talk about this set of circumstances. What if the first part happens? So my head is cut off. But the second thing doesn't happen. I don't die. So you cut off my head, and I'm still alive. I'm still like, my head is on, you know, I put my head over here. Beep, still giving the video lecture, you know, my, maybe I can't move my hands, but I'm still alive. You'd be like, whoa, whoa. If his head was cut off, he didn't die. Well, I guess that's that's a counterexample right there to that claim. This was saying if you cut off Tim's head, then he will die. Then he'll definitely be dead. But it didn't happen. The first thing happened without the second thing. So if that really did happen, which, you know, again, this is just a matter of what's possible. I don't think this is actually true. But if it did happen that my head was cut off and I was still alive, then whoever made this claim, they'd have to acknowledge that what they said was false, that it wasn't true. Um, here's another example I actually like to use, and, and this might, um, this kind of gets more into like how claims are, you know, I make a claim and you might believe me or not believe me, or you might think it's true and then find out it's false or something. Like we were, I was talking about how validity, uh, it, which is a conditional claim, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. How we can think about that kind of like a guarantee. So imagine, here's another uh, conditional claim. Let's say I, I say, um, if, well, I made this claim earlier uh, in this lecture. I said, if you study uh, some logic every day, you will achieve mastery of logic. And let's, let's make it a little less fuzzy. Let's say um, I make this promise to you. I say, if you do 15 minutes of truth tables every day, then you'll get an A on your logic exam. Say I make that promise. You might be, be like, okay, let's say you study every day and you pass the exam. Then you're like, oh, you know what Tim promised came true. But you might be worried, and you might not believe my promise, in as much as you're thinking it's possible that you might do all that work and not pass the exam. If that happened, and you might come to me and say, Tim, I did everything you asked me to. You told me if I was going to study 15 minutes of logic every day that I'd pass the exam. And look, I did the study, but I didn't pass. WTF, Tim, you made that promise. It didn't come true. So this is how this is another example to demonstrate how our intuition tells us that as long if this case is happening, then a conditional statement is false. Okay, that this situation would be a case in which this claim is false. Okay, now here's the weird thing. What happens? What truth value do we want to put to this statement if the first thing doesn't happen? If the part that the conditional is talking about is the precondition, never occurs. Let's go. Let's go back to the um, the one about studying. So, if I tell you, if you study 15 minutes of logic every day, then you'll pass the logic exam, or the logic portion of the exam. Um, and you don't study, then what does that mean for my promise? Was my promise a true promise or a false promise? Um, I've, I've gotten different responses from students. Sometimes when I teach this class, it's like 50-50 the students who think it's true and the students who think it's false. And that, 
that shows that there's some there's some real ambiguity here in terms of our intuitions about conditionals. And really, there's been a bunch of psychological studies that have shown that our uh, our intuitions and reasoning about conditionals is really, really notoriously bad. That there's a lot of ways in which we make classic mistakes with how we reason with conditionals. We see conditionals as um, playing certain logical roles that they don't actually play. Um, it's kind of like a gambler's fallacy. Maybe you've heard of gambler's fallacy. That like, uh, it's an intuitive judgment we make that if we like, uh, let's say I roll a dice 20 times and it never comes up six, then I'm like, all the other ones get rolled, but not six. And I'm like, the next time I roll the dice, the chances are increased that it'll be six, when it really isn't. Every time I roll the dice, it's the same probability of what's going to happen. Um, there's still a one in six chance I'll roll a six the next time I roll a die. But we think that hey, the, the way things have gone has not been proportional, so the next ones, it's even more likely it'll be six if I you know, haven't rolled a six yet. That's gambler's fallacy. It's a classic psychological mistake and reasoning that we make about probability. That's kind of similar to what happens with our intuitive judgments about conditionals. Um, but I think in, that's why I like this example. If you cut off Tim's head, then Tim will die. If my head is not cut off, then would you say the statement is false? I mean, I don't think you want to say that. I mean. Right now, I'd say, I think the statement is true of me. If you cut off my head, I will die. I mean, that's, I need my head on my body to live. That needs to happen. But my head's not cut off right now. That's not what's happening. And still, the statement is true. Okay? So we're, we actually are, I mean, to let the cat out of the bag here, we are going to be putting true values here for these two cases. If the, if the first part of the conditional is, uh, doesn't happen, the conditional is true. Uh, but that might seem a little weird, and so I'm going to give you this little sort of logical fairy tale to explain why the conditional has this truth table to it, uh, if that seems counterintuitive to you. And in the process, we'll be able to demonstrate some cool things about logic. Um, okay, so, um, oh, uh, one other thing I want to talk about. So I'm talking about the first part and the second part. There, there actually are fancy names for all of these things. Um, and I might start using this terminology because it's nice to use exact, accurate terminology, but I want to tell you what, I'm, what my words mean. If we're talking about a conjunction, we can talk about the two parts of a conjunction as conjuncts. That's what we refer to them as. So this thing and this thing are both called conjuncts. They're the parts of a conjunction. And remember, again, conjunctions could have like really complicated things, and those would be the conjuncts. They don't have to be simple letters. But whatever are the two parts that a, and a conjunction is putting together, those things are called conjuncts. For disjunction, I bet you can guess what this one's going to be. We call the parts of disjunctions disjuncts. And when it comes to conditionals, um, well, let's say something else about and and or. Saying P and Q really is the same thing as saying Q and P. They're symmetrical. You can flip them. It's not going to affect the truth value. It's saying both of them have to be true. So it doesn't matter what order we talk about them in. Same thing is true with or. It won't matter which one is first and which one is second because they're going to have the same value either way. So P or Q is saying the same thing logically as Q or P. There's no difference here. Same truth table, same logical meaning. But with conditionals, they're asymmetrical. They're totally different. It very much matters which thing is first and which thing is second. Because if it's the first part that's true and the second part that's false, that's a false value, but if it's the first part that's false and the second part that's true, it's actually a true value. So it matters, and we're going to have different names for these two things as a result. So the, uh, the first thing we call the antecedent, and the second thing we call the consequent. The antecedent and the consequent. Um, I hope you can sort of see this. Um, I hope that resolution is good enough here on the video that you can see antecedent is the first part and consequent is the second part. And we need to give them different names because the order really matters when, it, when we're talking about conditionals here. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's go through the little logical fairy tale about why we're giving true values here. I've appealed to one intuition right off the bat that um, don't these sorts of conditional statements, can't they be true? even if the first part doesn't happen. I mean, that's a, that's a thing. So um, uh, that's one intuitive sort of thing. But in logic, we don't want to just rely on intuition. We want to have 
things a little more uh, precise and especially necessary. We want a total proof for things. We don't just want to be guessing around with logic. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause the video and I'm going to give us some more space on the whiteboard um, without erasing this because I want to come back to it. Uh, and then I'll walk you through this logical fairy tale. So let's take a little break. All right, so this is this might be a little wacky because uh, I actually kind of want to point at some of these things over here, but I, I think I can fix it by I'm just going to um, bring back in here uh, the P and Q parts so we can see the initial conditions because we're really just focusing on conditionals here. So remember again, you know, on the other side we had set up the conditions. The, what I've been calling the inputs to calculate the outputs. And again, it looks like this. All right. So we've got some clues here. Um, for one thing, uh, okay, so here's another little intuitive uh, argument, and then we'll get into the proof. Um, remember I was drawing the meaning of these different types of logical statements using this map of all possible worlds or possible situations. Um, we've got all the cases represented here, you know, where P and Q are both true, that's like this, where they're both false, that's like this, where one's true, the other's false here, and vice versa here. Okay, so we had them all figured out. Now, if we gave the truth, let's figure out these two values, because we these are ones we're a little more intuitive, uh, intuitively confident about. So this one's definitely, we're going to leave that open. That's open. This is true, but we're eliminating the possibility that the first thing could be true and the second thing false. So, so far, we've got this, and then the, the last two that we're wondering about go here. Now, if we make them false, because I was saying the real values are like cat out of the bag, it's actually going to be true. But what if we had made them false? If we were false, then we're saying, telling you if P then Q is eliminating these possibilities. And they're saying, this claim is saying those things can't happen if we, put tr if we put false values here. But what does this look like? This map of meaning looks exactly like P and Q. That's saying they both have to be true. If either one of them is false, then the whole thing's false. But we don't really think that saying if P then Q is saying the same thing as P and Q. So this can't be right. This can't be what's going on. All right, but how, how are we going to be able to explain what really should be going on? That's the real, that's the kicker here. Well, let me show you something about how logicians think. Logicians think that, um, well, we've got the kind of core axiom of logic. I highlighted it on that little uh, document that I made as like a cheat sheet here. The logical meaning of a statement is the same thing as its truth conditions. So if two things mean the same thing, then they have the same truth conditions. Okay, so they're, they're going to have the same truth table. So we might be looking for what's some other expression that we think is logically equivalent to the conditional, but then we could we could figure out its truth table with more confidence, and then use its truth table to figure out the values that we're uncertain about. That's the kind of strategy here of this. And by the way, if this part of the lecture is not making a ton of sense, don't worry about it too much. I don't think too much hinges on being able to follow it, but I think this might help make some things click uh, uh, for some of you, and it's kind of just fun to do and cool and teach a little more logic here. So. Um, if, I, if I'm trying to show that two things um, mean the same thing in logic, if they have the same truth tables, then we also talk about them as being mutually derivable. That if one of them is true, the other one is true, and vice versa. So if I have two different expressions, and I'm able to prove this one given this one, and I'm able to prove this one given this one, then they are the same. And actually, this is what the biconditional is going to mean, but we haven't talked about that yet. Uh, let's just, you know, just use this sloppy thing of like they mean the same thing. They are equatable to each other. Um, and you can see how uh, certain logical statements that are don't mean the same thing, how they're going to fail this. For example, if I'm uh, wondering whether P and Q is the same thing as saying P, which it obviously doesn't, but we can show how it would fail this test. You know, given that P and Q is true, do you know that P is true? Yeah. You can derive that. Given this, therefore that. That's fine. That checks out. But given P, if you know P is true, does that mean that you know P and Q is true? No, you don't. So the fact that they've not, they're not mutually derivable means they don't mean the same thing. I'm actually going to use another example here. We've got, we've got even more logic in. You're getting 
you get in the deluxe version of this lecture. Let's show a case in which it does work out. So uh, this is a, a famous little um, logical transition that's called the uh, De Morgan's rule, actually, the De Morgan's rule, and that tells you that um, not P and Q, or this is one version of the De Morgan's rule, denying that P and Q are both true is the same thing as saying that at least one of them is false, that either P is false or Q is false. These things mean the same thing. And we can we could do truth tables to prove that they have the same truth table. We could do all those truth calculations. Uh, and in fact, I might do that later in the lecture here to get some more practice with calculating truth tables. But let's just look. We could even think about it intuitively. If you're saying it's not true that P and Q are both true, if that's a false statement, we're saying this whole thing is false. But well, we know how negation works. It just flips the truth value of whatever it's negating. So if the whole thing is false, then this part has to be true. Okay? If the whole thing is going to be... Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. Whoa. I just messed up really badly. So when I'm saying not P and Q, I'm really saying that statement is true, not false. Big, big mistake. My apologies. Um, I wish it was easier for me to go back and re-record things, but I'm not that savvy. So at least with this program. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to roll with that. So if I'm telling you it's true that it's not the case that P and Q are both true, then this negation would have to flip this statement being false in order to make the negation a true statement. Sometimes negations can really mess with your head, but we make claims that something is not the case, like it's not raining right now, and that's true. That's a true statement. Okay? If I'm saying it's not raining uh, and hailing right now, that would be like making this statement. It's not the case that it's both raining and hailing at this moment. So I'm, uh, that's a true statement as long as this statement is false. But what does it take in order for an and statement to be false? Well, it means they can't both be true, which means at least one of them has to be false. Like maybe this one's the false one and this one's true, um, or this one's true but this one's false. That, that would make a false and statement. Or they can, they can both be false, and that, was, that would make it false too, but at least one of them has to be false. And that's all that this is saying. This is false, or this is false. P is false, or Q is false. That's it. Okay, so given this, if I'm assuming that this is true, then I'm able to derive this logical information. And let's we'll go the other way. If I know that at least one of P and Q is false, then it's not possible for them to both be true. Right? If at least one of them is false, then it's not the case that both of them are true. So that checks out that way too. Given this information, we're able to derive this information. So that shows that these two statements are, they have the same logical meaning, and that means they'll have the same truth table. So now, when we're dealing with the conditional, we're trying to figure out, I'm just going to fix I've got this statement, which is a little mysterious to me, maybe. I'm like a little confused about what truth values to give it. And I'm like, what other statement could it be mutually derivable from? What, so let's we'll try, try to do the proof both ways. Given this, what do I definitely know? Well, we've gotten a little bit of progress here with our conditional. We know, and this is, this is kind of the clue that we're going to leverage here in the proof, we know that we're pretty confident that if this is the situation that's happening, if you cut off Tim's head and he didn't die, then that means it's definitely false to say that if you cut off Tim's head, then he will die. Okay, so we're, we're feeling really confident about this. So let's see, if, if we know that this statement is true, then that means this can't happen. You know, the fact that it has a false value. If I'm saying P and Q is true, then we're saying this cannot occur. This, this state of affairs, this combination can't happen. And we can articulate that in logic. We can say it's not the case that P is true and Q is false. We can do that as not Q. So because of the truth table that we were the, the truth table value here that we were confident about with the conditional, we know that given this being true, this also must be true. Okay. You can't have this combo happening. And we express that this way. It's not the case that P is true and Q is false at the same time. Can't have that. All right, so now the real question is, 
given this information, can we get this information? That's the next step of the proof. If we can get it both ways, then we know these things are the same. And then I can use the truth table for this to figure out the truth table for this. That's the, that's the big picture plan here. So let's take a look at it. We got not P and not Q, like that. And we're saying the statement is true, just like I did with, I kind of screwed up with my last example, right? We're saying, let's, given that this statement is true, what can we figure out? If this statement is true, and we know how negation works, and that means this has to be false. Okay. So far, so good. Okay, so now for looking at this. Let's make an assumption and see what follows from it. Let's just grant, for the sake of argument, that P is in fact true. And I'm going to put a little dotted line over it to indicate that this is an assumption we're making. We're not able to prove this based on the fact that and can be false, because there's a lot of ways that it could be false. It could be that P is false, and that's what's making it false. But let's just assume, let's, for the sake of argument, let's assume P is true. If P is true, and this whole AND statement is supposed to be false, then that means this second conjunct, the second part of the conjunction, has to be false. Because if they were both true, then this would come out true. And we're like, that, that's not what's happening here. We're saying it's got to be false. So if the AND statement is going to be false, at least one of them has to be false. That's what we showed in the last group. And so that if this one, if we're assuming this one is true, we're kind of just doing that for the sake of argument, then this part has to be the bad apple of the two. But if not Q is false, then that forces us to say Q is true. Uh -huh. So what did we just do here? We made an assumption. Let's just say if, if P is true, and this statement is true, which is you know, what we're trying to work with, then we were forced to make Q true. But that's just what this is saying. If P is true, then Q must be true, given this information. So, so given this, we were forced to say, we, we learned that this is also true. As long as this is true, then this must be true. So this part of the proof also checks out. Boom. And we've got it both ways. We were able to derive this from this, and we were able to derive this from this. Awesome. That's a logical proof, that they have the same logical meaning. Um, if this is a little tricky to follow, uh, usually this is when I like to ask for questions, and I can't do that. So if you've got questions, please come to me and ask them, and I can I can explain it some more. Or you can just like watch the video a second time. But if that's not doing it for you, then I'd love to help. If you're if you're curious about this, you want to make sure you're thinking about it right. And just to be super explicit here, I will not ever be asking you to try to make your own proof to prove something logically on the exam. That's all the stuff that I showed you in the first video. That's as far as we're going to go. Translate things from English into the formal logic language. Run truth tables and then use those truth tables to test for validity. I'm not going to make you do something like this. But this is still a big part of what logicians do. They use this kind of methodology, just more complicated situations. Okay, so we know that these things are the same. And what that means is now, if they mean the same thing, they have to have the same truth tables. So now, let's figure out the truth table for not P and not Q, we'll figure out all those values, and then we can use that to, to confirm um, the truth table for the conditional. So I'm going to do that right now, and this will get us a little more practice at, um, at uh, doing truth table calculations, which is something we were, I was teaching in the last lecture, but might want to see some more practice of. Um, but I'm going to have to pause the video temporarily because we're running out of disk space. So I'm going to pause that, and then we'll come back and do that. All right, I think we're back, and I got some more recording time. So let's do it. Um, all right, so uh, we're filling out a truth table here for this expression. Um, we're looking at all the different possibilities and figuring out what's happening with not P and not Q under all those situations. So if you're over here on your scratch paper, and you've got the expression that you're trying to evaluate, and we're just going to do these calculations one by one. We've got four different calculations to make. Let's figure out what happens when P and Q are both true. So I plug that in, wheel of fortune style, and then we're calculating inside out. That's the whole way we want to do this. So the, the first thing that we have to get is this chunk, the not Q chunk. I know Q is true, but that will make not Q false. There we go. So the not Q chunk is false when Q is true. Now I've got a true and a false. Ignore this for the time being. True and false. That's going to be a false statement because and statements are only true if both parts are true. 
Okay. And now that we're negating this chunk, so we bring that in, and a negation will flip false to a true. All right. So that's the, the value that applies to the whole expression. That's the value we're going to plug in here. Under these conditions, we calculated this statement is true. Awesome. Now, let's do the next one. What happens when P is true but Q is false? P true, Q false, same game. If Q is false, then that means not Q, we'll flip it, true. And now when I'm looking at this AND statement, true and true, well, that is a true statement. That's how AND statements are true, is when their two parts are true. And now we're negating something true, that's going to get us false. Okay. And that's the value that we'll put here. Now we got this case. What about when P is false and Q is true? Let's figure that out. So this one, P is false, Q is true. Well, the negation is going to flip that to false. Now we have a false and false statement. That's a false statement because they got to both be true for and to be true. The negation will flip it to be true. <laughs> so now, now we're getting somewhere on working on these cases that we were confused about with the conditional. And now finally one more. What happens when P and Q are both false? The negation flips this to true, but it doesn't matter because the AND statement can be both parts to be true. We've got a false part, so that's a false statement. And then the negation is going to flip it and make it true. Okay. So that's the value we put there. We've got a full complete truth table for this expression. The previous stuff, we were showing how this means the same thing as this. So now we can take this true. The first two lined up, that's great. You know, that's what we wanted. And now we can use these values, we can plug them in here because we showed that these expressions are logically equivalent. And if they have the same meaning logically, then they have to have the same truth table. So we'll give them the same truth table. So that's the story about how the conditional got its truth table. Um, okay, uh, and we got a little more practice here with doing truth tables. We still have one more thing to talk about, and that's the biconditional. But somehow my computer's telling me I'm almost out of space again. That didn't take long. Uh, okay. Maybe, well, let's see, I got a minute. <laughs> yeah, I'll go back and clean it up if we have to. But here's a biconditional. The biconditional is saying if and only if, which we usually summarize as uh, IFF in philosophy, IFF. And it has this truth table. It looks like this. When we're looking back at the conditions P and Q, because that's what we're talking about here, when they're both true, it's true. If they're both false, it's true. If they have different values, those are the false values. A biconditional is basically saying the P's and Q's always go together. They're either both present or they're both not present. You never get one without the other. That's what Okay, so uh, I got kicked out of the classroom that I was in because another class is coming in. So we've got um, some more work to do. Um, let me finish things up in talking about um, biconditionals. So... We've got um, we've got our biconditional expression here, and I was giving you the truth table for it based on its component parts again. Oh man, that is not so visible. Uh, here, let's see if I can fix this. My apologies. Okay, I got a new marker. Hopefully, this will work a little bit better. Okay, so we've got man, this video has been so challenging to make. Okay, I can't be by conditional Q based off of what's happening with P and Q. We've got true, true, false, false, setting up all the possibilities again. These are all the different things that could happen, and these are the results. So, you know, if the, the pattern I was describing is going on with the by conditional is that as long as P and Q have the same truth value, then it's true. If they have different truth values, then it's false. And this is kind of like saying that in the biconditional, um, P's and Q's always go together. I think I just said that. Um, they always go together. That's what P biconditional Q, or P if and only if Q, is saying. So um, we might say that, uh, well, no, we can't do it that way. But uh, it, there's a lot of, we don't make a lot of biconditional statements in everyday life. Um, but the people that do make a lot of them are philosophers. Philosophers are always wanting to talk about What's the essence of something? What is it really all about? Um, what's essential versus what's contingent? Uh, contingent could be, but maybe not. Um, what is something that is always a part of something? Like, what's the essence of justice? That, like, if there is justice, 
then there's something else that's happening, and if, ju if that other thing is happening, then justice is happening. Like, when we're talking about essences, we're talking about biconditional relationships. Um, and I think where I, when I cut off on the video before, before I got interrupted with the time to leave the classroom, I was saying that the biconditional statement is really saying the same thing as if P then Q and if Q then P. That's all getting on the video. Good. So um, it's saying that basically you know, if we're thinking about conditionals as asymmetrical one-way relationships, that if I'm saying if P then Q, then it's kind of like it only, the street only goes one way. That just because if P then Q is true doesn't mean if Q then P is true. Those are different things. Just because um, if I'm beheaded, then I will die doesn't mean that if I'm dead, that means I was beheaded, okay? unless I'm Highlander, of course. But then that would be to say both of those things are true. Um, that would be to say it's a two-way street. And that's what we mean by the biconditional. We're saying if P then Q and if Q then P goes both ways. Um, in fact, sometimes in other logical uh, languages, you'll see a conditional expressed like this and the biconditional like that. Um, and that, those actually mean slightly different things than um, the horseshoe and the, the biconditional in a lot of contemporary logic books. But because um, like we were saying, conditionals have uh, very uh, there's some subtle vari variations of it. So sometimes we want to use symbols to, use, to mean different things. Um, but uh, that, that's how you can think about the biconditional, two-way street. If we did a truth table for that expression, we would get this. And because those things mean the same thing, they'd have the same truth tables again. So that's a biconditional, much, uh, not quite as complicated as, um, as the, uh, the, can the standard vanilla conditional, uh, material conditional, um, but that's how it works. So you can kind of remember the, the, um, the biconditional pattern is if the two component parts have the same truth value, both true, both false, then it's a true statement. But if it's one without the other, then that's that's a false statement. So there we go with um, with the biconditionals. That's all we got there. And I think I'm going to call that a wrap on this video um, because we're getting to like the 50 minute mark, and I think um, we're we're going to do some more practice with truth tables. But I think I want to do that in the next video because I, uh, we're going to uh, have to talk about also using truth tables to check arguments for validity. You saw a simple uh, illustration of that in the first, the part one video, but um, I want to do that a, a little bit more and, and get some more practice with it and you can see it some more. So we'll do that on the next video. Until then, bye.